Hello, brothers and sisters. Welcome back. For those of you who have seen all four parts prior to this of uh, this study on uh, David versus Goliath and Jesus versus Gog, this is part number five. Please, if you have not seen parts one through four, please go back and watch them first. Hallelujah. Uh, I promise I'm not going to recap part all four parts before I even start part five. Promise I won't do that this time. But I will remind you of what passages we have been in up till now. The first four parts of this study included 1 Samuel 17, 1 Samuel 30, uh, Revelation 16, um, what else? Ezekiel 38, Isaiah 10, and now we are going to start Ezekiel 21. We're going to do the whole chapter here in part 5. We may or may not get to Jeremiah 50. I'm chomping at the bit for the fall of Babylon in Jeremiah 50, but we may have to make a part 6 for that. So please see the first four parts first. I'm going to show you some stuff in Ezekiel 21 that's going to blow your mind um, and how you can match it up with Daniel 8, Daniel 11. All right, it's going to be really cool. I'm glad you're here. Let's go ahead and open up the Word of God to Ezekiel chapter 21. And don't forget what we're studying. We're looking at how cool it is that the bowls of wrath are scheduled to last around 40 days long, right? We're not recapping, don't worry, but isn't it interesting how Goliath shook his fist at the men of Israel, right, and brought reproach upon them for 40 days, right? Israel's enemies brought reproach upon them. Well, the siege of Jerusalem that's coming Phase two of that, uh, we'll really see that when we get to the very last uh, part of this study, which will be Ezekiel 4. And we'll probably get to that in the next part. But in Ezekiel 4, you're going to see that phase two of the siege of Jerusalem, when Judah and Jerusalem is paying for its iniquities, is scheduled to last 40 days. Now, the Lord's going to shorten the days as he desires, for there'd be no flesh left alive in Jerusalem to save at that Zechariah 14 return of Christ to the Mount of Olives. But yeah, it's really cool how the enemies of Israel, right, bring that reproach upon the men of Israel for 40 days. And we see that again in phase two of the coming siege of Jerusalem. We've looked at that a lot. That's why you need to see the first four parts first, right? This is, we're talking about the future bowls of wrath. When these approximately 40 days are going to be going on. In fact, Daniel 12 tells us uh, when it talks to us about the day 1290 and day 1335, which is the resurrection to life, that's a 45 day period for the bowls of wrath. Okay, we looked at that in Daniel 12 and Revelation 16. But the Lord's going to shorten those days of the bowls of wrath as much as he desires. But he's going to pour out the six bowls and you're still going to have the my assembly of kingdoms of Zephaniah 3 and Joel 3 going on during the bowls. Let's go ahead and open up Ezekiel 21. Got more cool stuff to show you. Come on, Ezekiel. There we go. Um, when's the last time you've been to Ezekiel 21? It consists of 32 verses, and you need to decide. This is between the Word of God and you. You need to decide whether Ezekiel 21 is a future chapter, a historical past chapter, or a combination of the both. But I'm going to help you out in, in, with your 
uh, decision making on that subject because I'm going to be taking you to other passages uh, in the Bible, especially the book of Daniel, that matches Ezekiel 21. And then I'll also take you to verse 27, which is the clincher. That's, that's the trump card. Boom. If anyone debates you and says Ezekiel 21 is passed, you pull out Ezekiel 21, 27 and go full house. You'll see what I mean. Hallelujah. All right, Ezekiel 21. Again, be thinking about the bowls of wrath, the conclusion to the siege of Jerusalem. Right, These last days when Gog is going to pass through Israel a second time. Gog of Magog, al Mazil, Iraq. The Assyrian Antichrist, he's going to pass through to start the appointed time of the end. Right? Daniel 11, 40b through 44, with 45 being the return of Jesus Christ. He's going to pass through in route to collect up the precious things of Egypt. But did you know just before Jesus returns, we gotta, we, God, has to get the Assyrian Antichrist back to the Mount of Olives just before Jesus comes. So Jesus can destroy him just like Isaiah 14 says Jesus is going to do. Right? So be thinking along those lines as we're reading this. But don't forget what we read in Isaiah 10, which was part Let's see, one, two, part three, when we read Isaiah 10, that's when you saw, right, Gog coming back to the land of Israel just before Jesus appears, right? Isaiah 10, and the shaking of the fist of the bride of Christ by the Assyrian Antichrist, just like Goliath did to the men of Israel, okay? Here we go, verse number one. And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face towards Jerusalem, preach against the holy places, and prophesy against the land of Israel. Okay, so there's your subject, all right? But when we get to verse 27, you'll get the timing, whether this is past or future. And the word of the... And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face towards Jerusalem, preach against... Uh, when you're studying 70th week of Daniel passages, point of time of the end passages, day of the Lord passages, whatever you want to call it, when you're studying these, often in the major and minor prophets, right in the first two or three verses, the Lord will say, this is against a people or a nation. And that's, that's how you know the subject. And also, what phase of the day of the Lord it is. In other words, is it the six trumpet judgments, uh, where Father is purging and chastising his people? Or are we talking about phase two of the day of the Lord after Jesus comes uh, at the seventh bowl last day? And now we're talking about fighting the battle of the great day of God Almighty during the early days of the millennium. So always look for the word against. Who is it against? What is, who is this prophecy against or a burden against, right? Son of man, set your face towards Jerusalem, preach against the holy places, and prophesy against the land of Israel, and say to the land of Israel, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I am against you, and I will draw my sword out of its sheath, and cut off both righteous and wicked from you. Right? So are we talking about the uh, um, King Nebuchadnezzar's days, or are we talking about our very near future? Right? That's what you need to be watching for, looking, looking for evidence, right? And if we're talking about the future, then when the Lord says, my sword, small s, in the New King James versions, who is that? If, if, if this is a future passage, a future burden against Jerusalem, who is the sword if it's against his people? Right? Those who have watched the four parts know, hallelujah, this is Gog of Magog. This is Ezekiel 38's Gog. Okay, the Assyrian Antichrist at the sixth seal, tricking Israel, coming against her with a huge, massive hired razor flying the bee army. That's who, but you might say, well, why would the Lord call it 
my sword if it's Gog the Antichrist. Okay, because um, Father makes it clear in His Word. In His right hand during phase one of the day of the Lord is Gog. And in fact, Gog's armies are called by the Lord, my invited guest, my camp, my army, right? You need to read Joel 2 if that sounds strange to you, right? You need to read Zephaniah 1, okay? This is the Lord saying, he's admitting it. Yeah, I'm using Gog. I'm going to use Gog for two to three years. And then I'm going to drop that sword, Gog of Magog, the Assyrian Antichrist and his forces, I'm going to drop that sword. I'm not going to call him my sword anymore. I'm going to pick up my severe sword at the seventh bowl. Now we're talking about Jesus, one like the Son of Man, Commander, Lord God Jesus, King of kings and Lord of lords, and he's leading the armies of heaven and to break the Assyrian Antichrist and his forces and the Bab Babylonian kingdom, right? Babylon, the great um, so, yeah, when you read my sword, don't read over that. You need to be thinking. If, if this is future, that's either Gog or it's his son. And it's small s. And it's, a, it's, it's the sword that's used against his people. Okay? This is Father's doing, but this sword is Gog of Magog. Verse 3, And say to the land of Israel, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I am against you, and I will draw my sword out of its sheath and cut off both righteous and wicked from you. Hallelujah. Because I will cut off both righteous and wicked from you, therefore my sword, small s, shall go out of its sheath against all flesh from south to north that all flesh may know that I, the Lord, have drawn my sword out of its sheath. It shall not return anymore until he has uh, performed the intents of his heart. Okay, until the end of his people has come. The appointed time of the end of my people, right? Daniel 11, Ezekiel 7, Amos 8, right? Jeremiah 4, Isaiah 7 and 8. Ezekiel 38, Psalm 83, hallelujah. Why is Father doing that to his people? Well, that's a whole other study in itself. But if you just want a, a, a fast piece of evidence that I actually know what I'm talking about, go read Ezekiel, uh, excuse me, Zechariah 13, verses 7 through 9. All right, that famous chapter just before Zechariah 14's return of Christ. Father tells you, what he's going to do to last day's Israel, which matches uh, Deuteronomy 31 at the end of it, just prior to the curse of the Song of Moses spoken of in Deuteronomy 32, right? Why is Father going to do this to his people? Because at the first seal, they're going to break the covenant with God and sign, officially, and sign a covenant with the Antichrist, that league of many, okay, which we're going to talk about when we get to verses 21, 22, and 23, okay? Let's pick up the pace. Verse 5, that all flesh may know that I, the Lord, have drawn my sword out of its sheath. It shall not return any more. Sigh, therefore, son of man, with a, with a breaking heart, and sigh with bitterness before their eyes. And it shall be when they say to you, why are you sighing? that you shall answer because of the news. When it comes, every heart will melt, all hands will be feeble, every spirit will faint, and all knees will be weak as water. Behold, it is coming and shall be brought to pass, says the Lord God. Now Israel's last chance of getting Father to relent from doing this is mentioned in the last two verses of the entire Old Testament. Malachi chapter 4, right? Those two witnesses, Elijah and Moses, that are coming. You may not agree that it, the second one is Moses, but when you realize what this covenant of death is that Israel's going to sign at the first seal, which will cause Father to remember the transgressions and iniquities and sins, who else would Father bring with Elijah? to act as two witnesses against his people. 
Who else but Moses? Moses was there when the original covenant with God was made. Hallelujah. And the two witnesses, Elijah and Moses, will show up at the fifth seal to start their 42 months of testimony and witnessing and giving of good counsel. But Father makes it clear here, Israel is not going to take that last chance. He's going to give them a last chance, but they're not going to take it. So Father, at the opening of the scroll, is bringing the curse of the Song of Moses, and it goes by many other names. Wrath of the face of him who sits on the throne, the wrath of the Lord of hosts, um, the wrath against his people. Uh, this is the, day, the coming day of the Lord against Israel and the rest of the world. Remember, Israel just simply drinks of the cup of madness first. All kingdoms of the world on the face of the earth will get their turn, says Jeremiah 25, 26. Get their turn to drink of this cup of chaos and calamity and madness, right? So the 70th week hasn't even started yet. But Ukraine, I hate to, to bring it up, but the people of Ukraine, that's an example of what the world's going to look like by the time the 70th week of Daniel is over. Many determined desolations will be accomplished. And I'm speaking of that mentioned in uh, Daniel 9. And if you're reading this with me, but you're going, brother, you ain't convinced me, convinced me yet that we're talking about the future, just keep, stay with me. Verse 8, again the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, prophesy and say, thus saith the Lord, say, a sword, a sword is sharpened and also polished. Sharpened to make a dreadful slaughter. When you hear that word dreadful, you need to be thinking of the day of the Lord is terrible, is dreadful, is amazing, is unusual. Okay? Be thinking of, along those lines. Right? The day of the Lord is dreadful and terrible. The day of doom. Uh, the time of Jacob's trouble. That's how it starts. And then the whole world gets to drink of the cup of madness before it's all over. Verse 10, sharpened to make a dreadful slaughter, polished to flash like lightning. Should we then make mirth? It despises the scepter of my son, as it does all wood. Now, don't read over something like that and not understand it and be okay with not understanding it. No, you need to seek out what is meant by that. Remember, this is Gog the Assyrian's army that Father is using during the trumpet judgments the first six primarily, well, also the seventh trumpet bowls of wrath because Jerusalem is under siege up until Jesus' seventh bowl return. But what I mean by that is it says, it despises the scepter of my son as it does all wood. What does it mean despises the scepter of my son? To begin to understand what that means, you need to be thinking about Ezekiel, excuse me, I did it again, Zechariah 13, verses 7 through 9, right? You need to be thinking about Isaiah chapter 7, Isaiah chapter 8, right? This Emmanuel prophecy. Let's read those real quick so you understand, plus I want to gain your confidence in the fact that I know what I'm talking about. The Lord is talking about during phase one of the day of the Lord, he's bringing Gog, the Assyrian Antichrist, against the inheritance of his son, Jesus. See, Jerusalem and Israel are the inheritance of Jesus. And when Father is bringing a sword, my sword, small s, not to be confused with Isaiah 27's, my severe sword, capital S, Jesus, this is the Antichrist. He's small sword. Father's going to use him for two to three years, right, to make everyone's life miserable and to repay his enemies and adversaries and to purge the nations of the wicked. Um, so to understand what, what we're talking about when we say despises the scepter of my son, let's go to Zechariah 13.
Zechariah 13 is a future chapter, just like Zechariah 12, Zechariah 14. We're talking about the same subject, the last days. All right, hold your spot in Ezekiel 21, but Zechariah 13, verses 7 through 9, just three verses. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, capital S, against the man, capital M, who is my companion, capital C. This is his son, uh, says the Lord of hosts. Strike the shepherd, capital S, and the sheep will be scattered. Does that have anything to do with Jesus on the cross? No. No, this isn't Rome coming against Israel. In Jerusalem, that's not what we're talking about here. Remember, Zechariah 12, 13, 14. This is the last day's return of Christ. Strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered, the people of Israel, his inheritance. Uh, then I will turn my hand against the little ones, and it shall come to pass in all the land, says the Lord, that two-thirds, talking about the land of Israel, that two-thirds in it shall be cut off and die but one-third shall be left in it. Why? Keep reading. I will bring one-third through the fire, will refine them as silver is refined, and test them as gold is tested. They will call on my name, and I will answer them. I will say, this is my people, and each one will say, the Lord is my God, as we move into the millennium. Okay? So, you see... The sword coming against the scepter, come against my shepherd, the man, capital M, who is my companion. It's Father's not bringing Gog against Jesus. Father is bringing Gog against Jesus' inheritance. Israel, Jerusalem, the daughters of Zion, the daughters of Jerusalem, okay, the bride of Christ. So that's what's meant in Ezekiel 21. We went to Zechariah 13 to give you a better understanding of why it talks about coming against, having Gog come against my scepter. Or, or how was it worded? Uh, I'm trying to remember what verse we were in in Ezekiel 21 when it talked about my scepter. There it is, verse 10. It despises the scepter of my son, small s, okay? And he, capital H, has given it to be polished that it may be handled. This sword is sharpened and it is polished to be given into the hand of the slayer. Okay? The scepter. Um, let's go to the Emmanuel prophecy in Isaiah 7. Uh, real quick, the Emmanuel prophecy in, in Isaiah 7 is very important. Nobody ever reads Isaiah 7 and 8. They think that we're talking about a past king of Assyria. No, Isaiah 7 and 8 is talking about the 70th week of Daniel, just like Isaiah 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, and pretty much the rest of the book of Isaiah. But the Emmanuel prophecy is more of the sword coming against um, Jesus' inheritance. But look how it's worded in Isaiah 7. All right. All right, look at verse... Eighteen, And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord will whistle for the fly. That's the same whistle that's mentioned in Isaiah 5. Okay. Uh, you need to be thinking Joel 2 while you're reading this. That the Lord will whistle for the fly that is in the farthest part of the rivers of Egypt and for the bee that is in the land of Assyria. They will come and all of them will rest in the desolate valleys and in the clefts of the rock and on all the thorns who are in the pastures. In the same day, the Lord will shave with a hired razor with those from beyond the Euphrates River, with the king of Assyria, the head and the hair and the legs, and will also remove the beard. You could keep reading. Uh, 
probably should have started reading uh, back in uh, verse 10 instead of starting in 18. Let's go back to uh, verse 12. I, sh- I, should have went, I should have started there instead of 18. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord. Then he said, Hear now, O house of David, is it a small thing for you to weary men? But will you weary my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin cal- shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Curds and honey he shall eat, that he may know to refuse evil and choose the good. Okay, I'll go ahead and f- finish reading 16 and 17. Um, this is the Emmanuel prophecy. This is exactly what Ezekiel 21 and Zechariah 13 is talking about. Right when the scroll is open, here comes the As- Gog the Assyrian and his hired razor flying to be army coming against Jesus' inheritance. Uh, 16 is, uh, is very Im- important, brothers and sisters, because if you ever wanted to know where in the Bible does it say the length of of the fifth seal from the abomination of desolation until the time uh, lights go out over Israel. You have your first sign in the sun, moon, and stars of Joel 2. Here comes the day of the Lord of hosts when the scroll is opened on the day the sixth and seventh seals are opened. If you ever want to know how much time Israel and the world will have before the start of judgment day, Once the abomination of desolation takes place in Jerusalem, it's right here. This is it. Verse 16. For before the child shall know to refuse evil and choose the good, the land that you dread will be forsaken by both her kings. Then the Lord will bring the king of Assyria upon you. Upon you? You need to be thinking about Revelation 3's upon you. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5 comes upon you, okay? Um, Then the Lord will bring the king of Assyria upon you and your people and your father's house, days that have not come since the day that Ephraim departed from Judah. We already read 18 through 22. Uh, Yeah, verse 16 is it. And people read over it. They don't realize what they just read. How long does it take? A newborn baby from the time it's born until it gets old enough to know to refuse evil and choose the good. That's a duration of time the Bible just gave you. Okay? It's talking about when Satan is cast to earth, when Elijah is cast to earth, when Moses is cast to earth, and the false prophet uh, through Satan and the Antichrist are going to be given evil counsel. The two witnesses and the Christians who understand of Daniel 11, 29 through 39, they are going to be giving good counsel to Israel and the world. So the fifth seal, brothers and sisters, uh, is not only the first year and some days of Christian persecution by Satan, but it's also, the time that Israel and the world will be hearing good and evil counsel at the same time. Everyone's going to have to decide. Israel's going to have to decide. Who's the real Messiah? Right? Is it the Assyrian? Is it Jesus? Right? When is Jesus coming? Um, so that duration of time, uh, only grandmas and moms know. My guess is it's probably around 13 months, but they know a newborn baby grows up old enough to know to the time when you have to start smacking the hand. And you might say, brother, you might be grasping at straws a little bit there. Well, I have other evidence that shows I'm not. For example, if you turn the page and you look at Isaiah uh, Isaiah 8, verse 4, we're talking about the same start to the day of the Lord of hosts. Right? When the scroll is open and Father begins performing the intents of his heart using the Assyrian and his army as a rod of anger, staff of punishment. In Isaiah 8.4 it reads, 
For before the child shall have knowledge to cry, My father, my mother, the riches of Damascus and the spoil of Samaria will be taken away before the king of Assyria. And you keep reading. Because he'll be passing through the eastern Mediterranean region, Gog coming out of the north. And, of course, he's going to hit Samaria and Damascus first en route to Israel. He'll pass through Israel, do lots of damage, and he'll be en route to Egypt to collect up the precious things there as well, says Daniel 11's appointed time of the end passage, Daniel 11, 40b through 45. So there again in verse 4, we see that same fifth seal dur duration. This is how long you're going to have to receive good counsel and bad counsel. you got to decide. Because when judgment day begins, when the scroll is open, Father comes to earth. Did you know that? That's what's going on in Joel 2.10. Okay? Father comes to earth. You have the first sign in the sun, moon, and stars. Is he visible? No. Does he bring Jesus? No. It's Zephaniah 1.7. Right? Joel 2.10. First sign in the sun, moon, and stars when the scroll is open. So that fifth seal is like the last thing that happens before Judgment Day begins. And then it'll last for seven trumpet judgments. Okay? So here it's a newborn baby grows up old enough to say, Mama, Dada. It's the same, I don't know, 13 months, whatever it is. Only the Lord knows. Brothers and sisters, this start to Judgment Day is the event the Bible speaks of in Matthew 24, Matthew 20, yeah, Matthew 24, in reference to no man knows the day or the hour. That's why in, I listen to me, I'm not going to read it because we're getting off the subject, but Isaiah 32, verse 10, talks about the same length of the fifth seal, just like what we read in Isaiah 7 and Isaiah 8. But it doesn't use uh, the analogy of a newborn baby. In Isaiah 32, 10, it just flat out tells you, I'm going to come and visit you, O daughters of Jerusalem. Uh, you got a year and some days, you complacent women of Israel, then I'm coming to visit you. And he's bringing his sword, Gog, the Assyrian, that he will use for two to three years. But not just on Israel. The world... Um, if this is a whole new concept for you, Father using the Antichrist to, to do his bidding, remember, Father has done that many times throughout the centuries. That's nothing new. Father will use whoever he wants to come against his people during a time of chastisement. And then when he's done using them, he'll bring someone else to destroy them. Right? So Father does this all the time. And he's going to do it again at the end of the age. So, yeah, Isaiah 32, 10, Isaiah 8, 4, and then in Isaiah 7, we, we saw that in verse 16. That's the length of the fifth seal, okay? The my scepter passage um, in Ezekiel 21 sent me on a different tangent, but I hope you learned a lot. Let's, let's get back to Ezekiel 21. Verse 11, and he, capital H, has given it, talking about the, the sword of the first um, phase of the day of the Lord, Gog the Assyrian, uh, he has given it to be polished that it may be handled. This sword is sharpened and it is polished to be given into the hand of the slayer, not the spoiler. That's a whole different individual. You know, like chapters like Isaiah 16, 4, when you're reading about the spoiler. That's the appointed general of Jeremiah 51, 27, who leads the ten kings of Revelation 17, 16 against the beast kingdom as a mortal, my mighty one's army, who rejoices at the exaltation of the Holy One of Israel. And they're used during the phase two of the day of the Lord called the battle of the great day of God Almighty as part of the weapons of indignation of Jesus Christ. So don't confuse the spoiler with the slayer. The slayer is Gog in the last days. And you may say, brother, this is all interesting, but you still haven't proved to me we're talking about a future event. Keep watching. Verse 12, cry and wail, son of man, for it will be against my people. 
against all the princes of Israel. Terrors, including the sword, will be against my people. Therefore, strike your thigh, because it is a testing. And what if the sword despises even the scepter? The scepter shall be no more. And you might say, Father's going to let that happen to Israel? Yes. Yes. There will only be 10%. Of Israel left in the land when Jesus comes. There will be some of them in Jerusalem. But the, re the two-thirds of the population will be dead. One-third will be in captivity. And then Jesus will, and the armies of heaven, you and me, will rescue them and bring them back to Israel and start the millennium. Because it is a testing. Uh, Ezekiel 21.13 does that have anything to do with Revelation 3.10? Right, in regards to Jesus saying that, uh, that there's, I'm bringing a test and I'm going to test all who dwell on the earth. Right, that's paraphrased. You read Revelation 3.10. That's exactly uh, what this is talking about. The big test. Right? Who's going to take the mark of the beast? When does the test get graded? When Jesus comes and he judges the, the dead and the living, he judges the dead first. Right? That's Daniel 7's judgment seat of Christ. Verses 9 through 11 of Daniel 7, he judges the dead first. Then he judges the living, and those who are alive and remain will be caught up with them in the clouds above Judea en route to Jerusalem. Hallelujah. So, uh, that was verse 13. See the three? That's in reference to Revelation 3.10. Verse 14, you therefore, son of man, prophesy and strike your hands together. The third time, let the sword do double damage. It is the sword that slays, the sword that slays the great men that enters their private chambers. I have set the point of the sword against all their gates that the heart may melt and many may stumble. Ah, it is made bright. It is grasped for, for slaughter. Swords at the ready, thrust right, set your blade, thrust left. Now, if this is becoming a little monotonous to you, talking about this sword, um, and it's kind of getting boring almost to you, it's if that's happening, it's probably because you don't believe this is a future event getting ready to happen on planet Earth. But I'm telling you, when we get to later verses, as we keep reading, you're going to find out, oh my goodness, this is a future event. All right? And once you believe that, then you hang on to every word in the Bible. Right? What did it say? What did it say? You care about what's said. Because if you believe it's getting ready to happen on planet Earth, Verse 17, I also will beat my fist together, and I will cause my fury to rest. I, the Lord, have spoken. Verse 18, the word of the Lord came to me again, saying, And son of man, appoint for yourself two ways for the sword of the king of Babylon to go. Pay attention, brothers and sisters. Okay, pay attention. It's starting to get good. When we're reading these next few verses, you need to be thinking about the appointed time of the end passage of Daniel 11, 40b through 44. And 45, of course, is phase two of the day of the Lord. That's the wrath of the Lamb, return of Jesus Christ when he breaks the Assyrian. Um, okay, so get your thinking cap on. Be thinking Daniel 11's appointed time of the end. Why? Because you're about to see Jordan mentioned, Amon Jordan mentioned here, just like it is at the appointed time of the end passage of Daniel 11. And everyone knows Daniel 11 is about the future, at least from verse 21 on. Okay? And you're getting ready to read about Jordan, and this is going to be the match to how Jordan gets out of punishment during phase one of the day of the Lord. Gog decides, I'm going to leave her alone, and I'm going to Jerusalem. Okay? So verse 19, And the Son of Man and Son of Man appoint for yourself two ways for the sword of the king of Babylon to go. Both of them shall go from the same land. Make a sign. Put it at the head of the road to the city. Now, right about now, three-fourths of you, 
are going, brother, don't you realize what you just read? You just said the king of Babylon. Why do you keep calling him the Assyrian Antichrist of the last days? The word just called him the king of Babylon. So maybe you're confused, oh, 70th week instructor, brother Wait. Well, when we keep reading, you're going to see I may be confused a lot of I may be confused about a lot of things, but not this. And you're going to go, well, if you're right, why is he called the king of Babylon here? Because, that's a great question, because this Assyrian who shall come forth at the first seal from Al-Mazil, Iraq, says Nahum chapter 1, verse 11, and Nahum 1 ends with verse 14 and 15 claiming, stating, that this is the final Antichrist that shall ever pass through Judah again. This one who comes forth from ancient Nineveh, Mosul, Al-Mazil, Magog. Um, oh, so he starts out as an Assyrian caliphate, but once at the fifth seal, when he is empowered... Him and his false prophet, empowered by Satan. All right? Now, uh, the mark of the beast goes out, and, and his Assyrian caliphate has grown, 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 and now he's empowered by Satan, and miracles are being worked like you can't imagine. And now, his uh, caliphate has turned into a true king of Babylon kingdom. Right? And we know it's a Babylonian kingdom, through many other chapters of the last days, like Isaiah 13, Isaiah 14, Jeremiah 50, 51. It's a Babylonian-style kingdom at the end. Starts out in the beginning of sorrows as an Assyrian caliphate, but grows, grows, grows. When we get to these other verses I keep claiming are here in this chapter that's going to prove to you this is a, a last days chapter, then I need you to go, okay, you were right about the king of Babylon being the Assyrian Antichrist, second half of the 70th week. He's now the king of Babylon. In fact, his headquarters during the second half will be in Baghdad. Did you know that? The image that shall speak mentioned in Revelation, I think it's chapter 17, I believe, um, will be set up in Baghdad. That basket of wickedness of Zechariah 5 in the land of Shinar, Baghdad. Also, note um, verse 26 of Jeremiah 25. It's talking about the uh, second half of the 70th week, the day of the Lord of hosts. All the determined uh, desolations are occurring. Father's performing the intents of his heart using this sword, right? Uh, in verse 26 of Jeremiah 25, um, you see who is saved for last as far as Father making each nation drink that cup of madness. Who's saved for last? Shishak. And you might say, brother, I don't have a clue where Shishak is. It's Baghdad. Look it up. So Zechariah 5 Shinar is Jeremiah 25 Sh Shishak is Babylon of Isaiah uh, 13 and 14. It's Babylon of Revelation 17 and 18. Okay? So let's get to those verses that prove this is a last day's chapter. But yes, the Assyrian Antichrist is now called the king of Babylon when he passes through Daniel 1140b. He's no longer the Assyrian. But Isaiah 13 and 14, Isaiah 14, I think it's verse 25, does call him the Assyrian. So God calls him the Assyrian even after he moves his headquarters to Baghdad, and some passages call him the king of Babylon. But Father does call him, still call him the Assyrian on the day that Father comes back to earth at the seventh bowl, and this time brings his son Jesus, commander of the Lord's armies of heaven. <clears throat> All right, let's get to those good verses. You, here we go. Now, this is Daniel 11's appointed time of the end. Daniel 11's pass through of Judah, pass through of Damascus, northern Israel, Israel, Judah, en route to Egypt, the initial pass through. 
okay, of Daniel 11. That's what we're talking about here and how he's not going to go west and also send a few battalions over there in brigades and take over Amon Jordan. He's going to leave Amon alone. You're going to see it here, and you also see it in Daniel 11. Verse 20. No, verse 19. And the son of, and son of man, appoint for yourself two ways for the sword of the king of Babylon to go. Both of them shall go from the same land to make a sign, put it at the head of the road to the city. It's a fork in a road. Appoint a road for the sword to go to Rabbah of the Ammonites and to Judah and to fortify Jerusalem. In other words, make your battle plans. Uh, make your routes. Determine your routes to each city, Ammon and Jerusalem. Don't send your army there yet, all right, but make your battle plans. Verse 21, for the king of Babylon stands at the parting of the road at the fork of the two roads to use divination, right? Revelation 18 talks about unbelievable sorcery. It might be Revelation 17. Unbelievable sorcery is going to be going on when the false prophet in the Assyrian Antichrist is possessed by Satan, all right? So don't let these verses talking about divination surprise you. We're not talking about the real past King Nebuchadnezzar. We're not. So here this king of Babylon, which is the Assyrian Antichrist, he shakes the arrows, he consults the images, he looks at the liver. In his right hand is the divination for Jerusalem, to set up battering rams, to call for a slaughter, to lift the voice with shouting, to set battering rams against the gates, to heap up a siege mound, and to build a wall. Right? He's going to start the siege of Jerusalem. Verse 23, and it will be to them like a false divination in the eyes of those who have sworn oaths with them, but he will bring their iniquity to remembrance that they may be taken. Do you realize what you just read? Okay. I'm looking at verse 23. 23, look at it again. And it will be to them like a false divination in the eyes of those who have sworn oaths with them, but he will bring their iniquity to remembrance that they may be taken. Does Israel swear oaths at the opening of the first seal? Yes. With this Assyrian, who here is called the king of Babylon. So this is the sixth seal, seventh seal, opening of the scroll and attack on Israel that you see in Joel 2. But this is making reference to what happened nine, uh, what happened two, three and a half years earlier or three years earlier. I'd have to get out the calculator and look at all the how long countdowns. But back at the first seal, Israel is going, this is future, is going to swear oaths during the covenant, during the signing of the league agreement made with many. Slow down now. What verse are we in in Ezekiel 21? 23. What does Father call this league agreement made with many in verse 23? Smile. Verse 23 of Daniel 11. The league agreement made with many. Isaiah 28, 18 calls it the covenant with death. So there's going to be leadership in Israel, right? That's the them is going to be swearing oaths with this Assyrian and many other nations at the first seal. But don't forget, Father calls that the covenant with death. And that's what brings to remembrance, his remembrance, Israel's Sins, iniquities, transgressions. Remember the oath and the covenant that Father signed, uh, verbally agreed upon with the, with the uh, men of Israel so many years ago during the days of Moses, right? And Father warned them, right? Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy 32, 
Father warned them. He begged them. He says, this even goes for your descendants. Don't you dare break this covenant with me if you go into agreement with me. And Israel's going to really anger Father at the first seal when they swear oaths to all the nations. We're not going to attack you. You're not going to attack us. We're going to share the gas coming out of the eastern Mediterranean Sea, right? We're going to uh, uh, have a seven-year peace treaty, right? Hallelujah. Well, it's not a coincidence, brothers and sisters, that this is verse this is verse 23 here, but that's talking about the oath and the covenant of Daniel 11:23, okay? And um, turn real quick to uh, Daniel 8. Hold your spot in Ezekiel 21. Turn to Daniel 8. What does verse 23 in Daniel 8 say? Now, Daniel 8, 23 is the first seal. Daniel 8, 25 ends with the seventh bowl return of Jesus. That Daniel 2, 44 breaking, right, the kingdoms of the Antichrist by the stone made without human hands, right? Daniel 2, 44, that's uh, Daniel 8, 25. But look at... See, the 2300-day countdown, not to get off into that subject, that teaching, but Daniel 8 is about the 2300-day countdown, from the rider of the first horse till the rider of the second white horse, right? Jesus, the Assyrian false messiah to Jesus, the true messiah. First seal, seventh bowl, 2300 days scheduled. They'll be shortened a little bit for the sake of the elect. Okay? Gabriel gives... Um, Daniel understanding in verses 23 through 25 of the 2300 day countdown, which in case you didn't know it is just under 77 months from writer to writer. How cool is that? But look what verse 23 says. And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors have reached their fullness, a king shall arise. That's the Assyrian antichrist having fierce features who understand sinister schemes Okay, we could keep reading, but we won't. But when the transgressors have reached their fullness, when do the transgressors of Israel reach their fullness, which is going to have caused Father to have to destroy them, break the power of the holy people, break the power of the holy city Jerusalem, until they cry out and acknowledge their offense to him and his son Jesus, uh, during the bowls of wrath. Okay. What is going to cause, what's the event that will cause the transgressors to have reached their fullness to where father says, that's it. I'm going to let this play out at the beginning of sorrows play out. Cause I want the people of the world to have a chance to realize what's going on. The fifth seal, I'm bringing the abomination of desolation. 30 days later, I'm bringing Satan and Elijah and Moses, and we're going to get this good counsel and evil counsel going at the same time. Give everyone in the world a chance. I want to identify my enemies and adversaries. And, uh, and then I'm bringing the heat when I have Jesus open the scroll. Judgment day, beginning with Israel, right? So my point is, and I won't labor this point anymore, what you're reading about bringing to remembrance during the swearing of oaths, right? We're talking about verse 23 of Daniel 11. We're talking about verse 23 of Ezekiel 21. And here we are in verse 23 of Daniel 8. Okay, it's all about Father getting furious at the first seal. Jesus, my son, open another seal. Jesus, go ahead, open the third seal. I mean... Father is just marking the days, and then when the scroll is open, here comes day of the Lord of hosts, right? The wrath of the Lord of hosts. So I wanted to point that out to you. Now, you may say, well, brother, that's interesting. The numbers all match, and I see we're talking about the swearing of oaths and covenants and league agreements, and you might be right, but you still haven't convinced me that 
Ezekiel 21 is last days. Well, don't worry, when we get to 27, you'll get your answer. All right, we left off at 1st 23, and it will be to them like a false divination in the eyes of those who have sworn oaths with them, but he will bring their iniquity to remembrance that they may be taken. Of course, when you're reading Matthew 24's, as in the days of Noah, you know what we're talking about when we're talking about taken away, right? Remember Zechariah 13, right? Ezekiel 4, we'll eventually get to. You'll read more about what's meant by Israel being taken away. Two-thirds die, one-third taken away into slavery, right? Father raising his hand against the little ones of Israel. You might say, why would Father do that? Because he's getting them out of the kill zone. And then you want to read more about that, go to Isaiah 57, verse 1. You'll see why Father is getting the women and children into captivity in the beast kingdom so he can get them out of the kill zone. And then Jesus will bring them back. He'll recover all, just like his grandpa, King David. Verse 24, we got to pick up the pace. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, because you have made your iniquity to be remembered. See how Father is, is continuing the thought? How that first seal action is really going to bug him? Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, because you have made your iniquity to be remembered, in that your transgressions, remember Daniel 8, 23, are uncovered when they swear this oath. That's why Isaiah 28, 18 calls it the covenant with death, right? That brings about the shadow of death. So that in all your doings, your sins appear because you have come to remembrance, you shall be taken in hand. This is, this is the one third is going into captivity, but at least they're going to be alive. Now to you, O profane, wicked prince of Israel, talking about a future leader whose day has come, whose iniquity shall end. Thus saith the Lord God, remove the turban and take off the crown. Nothing shall remain the same. Exalt the humble and humble the exalted. Are we talking about the last days? Are we talking about King Nebuchadnezzar? What time frame in human history or future are we talking about? Guess what? You're about to read it. Next verse. Hallelujah. Verse 27. Overthrown, overthrown, I will make it overthrown. It shall be no longer until he comes, capital H, whose right it is, and I will give it to him. Do you realize what you just read? It will be overthrown until. It will be. It will never not be overthrown again after I perform this, says the Lord, and I bring my sword, small s, against my son's scepter, right? Right? This people of Israel, their power of the holy city and the holy Jerusalem, uh, something like that, will happen and no one will save them until I bring my son, right? Their power, that's why it's called the, uh, the, end, the, the time of the end of my people, the appointed time, right? It shall be no longer until he comes whose right it is, and I will give it to him. Therefore, and don't deny this, brothers and sisters, those of you who like to cling on to this, this old notion that all the major minor prophets are historical lessons, of what Father has done in the past with his people. No, because if this was about the past, then Israel wouldn't be back in the land today. Because it's overthrown until Jesus comes. After this purging, after this taking away, this taking away by the my sword small s is future. And that just proved it. Now, if there's any of you out there that is still, you're just stubborn and it still doesn't convince you, I'm sorry, then there's nothing else I can do for you. But it will remain overthrown until... Jesus comes. So we're talking about the 70th week of Daniel. Seventh bowl, last day, Jesus comes. Boy, I hope that helped somebody. Let's finish this chapter. Verse 28 through 32 to end the chapter. And you, son of man, prophesy and say, thus saith the Lord God concerning the Ammonites. Now we're back to talking about Jordan. And concerning their reproach and say, 
a sword and sword is drawn, polished for slaughter, for consuming, for flashing, while they see false visions for you, while they divine a lie to you, to bring you on the necks of the wicked, the slain, whose day has come, whose iniquity shall end. Notice that we're talking about punishment on the Ammon Jordan. Well, it's not Ammon Jordan. They called him the Ammonites, so that must be past history. No, don't let that confuse you. The Lord still knows them as the Ammonites, but we're talking about Ammon Jordan. But look, we're talking about Ammon Jordan after Jesus comes, right? Until he comes whose right it is, and I will give it to him, right? Jerusalem and Israel. Now Jesus comes back at the seventh bowl and starts the battle of the great day of God Almighty, right? And now Jordan receives her punishment, just like it says in Jeremiah 25, okay? When you see Jordan in Jeremiah 25 receiving her punishment, you know that that verse to the end of the chapter in Jeremiah 25 is talking about phase two of the coming day of the Lord when Jesus is conducting the wrath of the Lamb during the battle of the great day of God Almighty. That's when Jordan receives her punishment. Hallelujah. Verse 30, return it to its sheath. I will judge you in the place where you were created in the land of your nativity. I will pour out my indignation on you. I will blow against you with the fire of my wrath and deliver you into the hands of brutal men who are skillful to destroy. Do not confuse that with Gog's army. Brutal men who are skillful to destroy. We have just stopped talking about Gog the Assyrian and his army. Now we're talking about the appointed general of, appointed general of Jeremiah 51.27 who is the leader of the ten kings mentioned in Revelation 17, 16. He's also the leader of the My Mighty Ones who rejoice at the exaltation of the God of Israel in Isaiah 13, 3. Right? In other words, you have the armies of heaven, right, taking care of business during the battle of the great day of God Almighty, but Jesus uses mortal men in addition to his armies of heaven. Why? Because Jesus and the armies of heaven are only going to thresh, as Isaiah 27, 12, talking about my sword now is my severe sword, capital S, Jesus, my son. He only threshes during the harvest from the Euphrates River Basin down to the uh, Gaza-Sinai border called the Brook of Egypt. That's Isaiah 27, 12. That's it for the... Uh, Threshing done by the armies of heaven. Who's going to thresh the rest of the Middle East and the rest of the world? The mortal, my mighty ones of Revelation 17, 16, and Isaiah 13, 3. And they're spoken of briefly in Jeremiah 51. But they're, taught, they're spoken of a lot in Jeremiah 47, 48, 49, and 50. They are. All right? These are the wine tippers. They come and they tip your wine. Because they are going to, you think things are desolate after Gog gets done. You wait till after the battle of the, great day, battle of the great day of God Almighty is over. And now the ten kings who turn against the beast and burn her with fire, wait till they're done threshing. Right? Isaiah 18 talks about how they'll thresh down the Nile River basin. Right? So that's why Jordan is positioned. The judgment on Jordan is positioned in Ezekiel 21 where it is. I hope somebody's enjoying this. Hallelujah. So brutal men who are skillful to destroy. That's not Gog's army of Joel 2. It's not. This is some of the assembly of kingdoms of Joel 3 and Zephaniah 3. All right, in the uh, last verse of Ezekiel 21, uh, you shall be fuel for the fire. Remember Revelation 17, 16? Your blood shall be in the midst of the land. You shall not be remembered. Talking about Ammon, Jordan. For, for I, the Lord, have spoken. Brothers and sisters, we're done with part five. The next part, part six, we're going to look at Jeremiah 50, and we're going to finally get to Ezekiel 4 and learn more about this 
uh, being taken away from the land of Israel. Which gives you more information about what you've been reading all these years in the passage in Matthew 24 when it talks about as in the days of Noah or in the days of Lot. It talks a lot about people being taken away. Right? You're going to get your answers to that when we go to Ezekiel 4. And yes, Ezekiel 4 is also future. And if you doubt me, don't forget that I proved to you today that Ezekiel 21 is future and that Gog the Assyrian will eventually be called the king of Babylon. So that should help you with your understanding of of the last several chapters of the book of Jeremiah when you're reading about the king of Babylon. And there'll be a few passages that bring to remembrance King Nebuchadnezzar, but those are about the future. Hallelujah! Well, brothers and sisters, please ask questions in the comments section. Um, I might know the answer, I might not. I hope you, those few of you who have watched all four parts, and now you're watching part five. You've just watched part five. Um, God bless you. I hope you're learning a lot. I know you are. And I just let me know if I'm a blessing to you, right? I need to get some uplifting. I need to get motivated. You know, sometimes I feel like I'm just talking to the camera. So let me know if I'm helping you. Brothers and sisters, until I see you again, God bless.